The other thing that states can be doing is really working on um, recruitment of poll workers for, for all of these sites. I mean, several polling locations in Wisconsin were closed, not because they needed to be, but because they simply did not have enough poll workers. So that's a huge issue. And then we think about this whole new group of poll workers who are coming in. They need to be trained, not only in how to administer an election, but they need to be trained in how to engage in all of the safety measures that are going to be involved. Good evening and welcome to our first virtual WGBH News Forum event. I'm Kate Zachary, the News Director for WGBH News. Thank you for your continued support of WGBH and especially of WGBH News. I'm incredibly proud of the work this newsroom does every day, seven days a week, to bring our audience high quality, local, trusted journalism. And tonight, our event focuses on the potential impact of the pandemic on our election process. Now I'm pleased to welcome an advisor to the development of the news forums, Susan Spurlock. Susan's the director of the Public Policy and Practice Hub at Suffolk University, and her accomplishments and awards are many, but I'd like to highlight her leadership as executive director of Suffolk University's Ford Hall Forum, the oldest free public lecture series in the United States. Good evening, and thank you very much, Kate, for that introduction. Uh, we are really excited to um, join with WGBH for this important conversation this evening. Fort Hall Forum at Suffolk University is continued to uh, support and work closely with, uh, in partnership with WGBH with this evening's program. In operation since 1908, the forum's mission is to foster an informed and effective citizenry through the public presentation of lectures, debates, and discussions. Now I am pleased to introduce this evening's moderator, Laura Colarusso. Laura is the digital managing editor of WGBH News. Prior to joining WGBH News, Laura was a member of the Boston Globe editorial board and a reporter at Newsweek. Laura also writes The Thread, a weekly newsletter bringing you the latest reporting from the WGBH newsroom. I now present Laura Colarusso. Thanks, Susan. And now to the introductions for our panelists. Seti Warren is the Executive Director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He also served as the Mayor of Newton from 2010 to 2018. He served as a Special Assistant to President Bill Clinton as New England Director of FEMA and as Deputy State Director for Senator John Kerry. Rachel Cobb is the Chair of the Political Science and Legal Studies Department at Suffolk University. She specializes in US elections, election administration, electoral politics, and political participation. In 2006, with a grant from the US Election Assistance Commission, Cobb established the University Poll Workers Project, a nonpartisan program that recruits college students to be more involved in elections. And last but not least is John Hagner, who is a partner at Clarity Campaign Clarity Campaign Labs, a consulting agency that provides data strategy and polling to Democratic campaigns and progressive nonprofits. He joined Clarity after serving as a national field director for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in 2012. Please welcome our panelists to the screen. Okay, great. Well, I want to dive right in tonight because we have a lot of ground to cover, but I have the first question is a question that's on the minds of many of our attendees tonight. Several of our guests wrote in to ask us, first of all, can a national election be moved? And if it can, by what mechanism can it be moved? John, do you want to kick us off? Sure, and, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, the short answer to the question of can the election be moved is no. Uh, the slightly longer answer is that there's nothing that you know the president could do on his own. In theory, if the House and the Senate and the president all agreed, they could move the election a little bit, but the Constitution mandates that the president's term ends January 20th of next year, and that can't be changed by anyone for any reason. So. In, well, in theory, we could push the election back a little bit. We certainly would have either a second term for President Trump or a new president starting in January, no matter what else happened. Okay, great. So given that, uh, Rachel, given that we can expect some changes, let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of, what the, of how this election cycle is going to work on the ground. 
what do you think some of the pain points or biggest challenges will be as the as to actually hold the election? Well, it runs the gamut from everything from the election departments and secretaries of state and states in general needing to alter their laws somewhat to expand perhaps early voting, to expand absentee voting, to develop the technology or use the technology to be able to track ballots. It means recruiting a whole new group of poll workers. Um, it might mean even changing polling locations. Several polling locations, for example, at least here in Massachusetts, are in um, uh, places with a lot of elderly people and they may not, you know, if they're in lockdown, might not want that foot traffic or permit that foot traffic. So there is so much planning that needs to happen from the, the big picture, the legal issues, all the way down to do we have enough hand sanitizer at every polling location and have we measured our polling locations to make sure that we can actually have social distancing at those places. Is that, is that work that's going on right now? That is work that is going on right now in um, Secretary of State's offices across the country. Um, but it is, as we all know, in this political climate, something that is also politicized. Um, and it is, it is, it will, all of the things that are required will require funding. And this is a difficult time for all states and all locales. So finding the, the right funding formula to be able to provide for all the contingencies that need to happen is also a challenge. So I think it is, it is certainly on the top minds of every election official in the country. And I think there is a great deal of anxiety about this. Uh, but it is also a negotiation between them and the state and also at the federal level over budget concerns. So let's look at this from the voters perspective now. SETI, we've all seen the pictures from Wisconsin, the dramatic photos of people waiting in line, long lines, because so many of the polling stations were closed, wearing masks, um, trying to protect themselves. You know, and people were forced to cluster, right? And which is the very opposite of what we were trying to do right now uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19. So are you concerned at all uh, with low voter turnout perhaps, or maybe even a repeat of Wisconsin in the fall? I am very concerned, uh, dovetailing off what Rachel just mentioned. Look, when I was the mayor of Newton, I saw up close uh, how complicated it is to pull off an election without a pandemic. Uh, it takes people, it takes uh, resources, it takes the right uh, equipment, uh, and it takes access for people to have access. What we saw in Wisconsin um, was really, really troubling. I mean, you had, um, you didn't have enough volunteers and staff, so they had to eliminate uh, locations for voting, which meant you had huge numbers of people waiting in line for hours. Talk about voter disenfranchisement. Um, and, and by the way, in the communities where there were long lines, those were in underserved communities. You're talking about areas of Milwaukee, uh, where communities of color and otherwise. So I have very serious concern. And I, I also want to dovetail off of something Rachel said around resources for municipalities and states right now. Um, the federal government has not come up with a solid plan to protect the budgets of uh, local towns and cities across the country. Uh, we just saw furloughs in Brookline. So uh, we're going to have an uneven sort of situation with voting. Uh, communities that may have some embedded resources where they could pull some of this off and can have communities that don't. Rachel and Seti, you've both now mentioned the role of the federal government. So I wanted to, to dive into that a little further. Um, what should the federal government be doing? If, if you mentioned a solid plan, what would that look like? What would you like to see the federal government doing right now? to ensure that voting goes smoothly. Do you want to go, go, go ahead, Rachel? <laughs> I'll start. Uh, it's, I mean, first of all, is the issue of resources, 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 just the funding that the states are going to need to be able to pull this off, I think is central. And then there are the other issues about you know, mandating that states have vote by mail, but I think that's a lot trickier um, to pull off in this political climate. So if we can agree on funding, then I, I think we can then move to the other things. But the first and foremost, it is, I mean, 
we want there to be, there is going to be so much change. Let me begin with that. There's going to be so much change for voters and communicating that information clearly so that the misinformation is not uh, the one that takes precedence, but rather the, the honest, sincere information of election officials trying their hardest to run a fair and safe election. So how we, so funding will go a long way toward having all of the necessary supplies, getting all of the people that we need to be there, and also providing for that information flow so that voters are aware and all of the confusion that's gonna come up, we need to have ways to address all of that confusion every step of the way. John, I wanted to ask you a question. Going back to Wisconsin, um, the Supreme Court, part of, part of the reason why Wisconsin was in the state that it was in was because the Supreme Court ruled that, it, that the state could not extend its deadline for mail-in ballots. Um, and I'm wondering if you think, or if, you, if you've seen any, any indication that this is going to be an issue that will affect the, uh, affect the election in November. Yeah, for sure. Um, the Supreme Court didn't allow an extension of the election, which I think was really unfortunate with all the chaos and the change. Uh, that made it a lot harder for people in Wisconsin's vote to count. But what the Supreme Court did do, and, and a lot of people didn't appreciate this at the time, is that they mandated that any votes that were postmarked on election day had to be counted. Different states and different localities have had different standards. Some places, and in Wisconsin before the Supreme Court, your ballot had to have arrived at the, at the uh, Board of Elections on election day in order for it to be counted. Um, we've seen that really disenfranchise voters all over the country. In 2018 in Florida, there were thousands of ballots sitting in post offices on election day that should have been delivered and weren't, and those votes were thrown in the trash. Uh, so the Supreme Court, well, it wasn't the decision I would have hoped that they wrote, as a, as a partisan, uh, really did go a long way toward mandating that places at least count all the votes that were postmarked on election day. And I think that'll really help. Got it. So just to clarify, that was a broad decision that will apply nationwide? It was a decision that will be able to be used by lawyers to argue that those votes should have to count. And there's lawyers working all over the country right now uh, bringing lawsuits on behalf of voters in, in every state to make sure that the laws are, are enforced in the fairest way. And that precedent from the Supreme Court will be incredibly helpful in making sure that those votes count. Great. All right, so back to Rachel. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit and we delved into what the federal government should be doing, but let's say those resources come through or let's say that they don't. What should the states be doing right now? Massachusetts, any other place you wanna cite, what should they be doing right now to ensure a free election come November? Free well, and fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, they should absolutely be expanding their vote by mail options and ideally mailing every eligible voter a ballot um, that that voter can then track knowing that it is coming to them and knowing that it has been delivered um, so that they have the confidence that that ballot was legitimately received by them. One of the other issues is that voters also need to have time. And so we need to have enough time for everybody to do everything they need to do. But let's say that a voter makes a mistake on their ballot and they need a replacement ballot. Ideally, that vote can be counted earlier, even if the results aren't aren't described until election day, having the opportunity to do a redo, which we can do um, at our polling locations when we do in-person voting. So, so thinking about time and expanding their laws around that. The other thing that states can be doing is really working on um, recruitment of poll workers for, for all of these sites. I mean, several polling locations in Wisconsin were closed, not because they needed to be, but because they simply did not, not have enough poll workers. So that's a huge issue. And then we think about this whole new group of poll workers who are coming in, they need to be trained, not only in how to administer an election, but they need to be trained in how to engage in all of the safety measures that are going to be involved. You know, thinking about tape <laughs> and, and, um, and, and hygiene. And so states need to also be, you know, the, the resources that we're talking about are also providing all of the safety materials that the, that the poll workers are going to need from um, 
gloves to sanitizers to um, think knowing how to set up a polling location so that it is safely managed. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. I wonder if we could just take Massachusetts for a moment. Could you grade how the state is doing right now in terms of getting answers to the questions that you're raising? There is a, a, a bill that is being worked on right now, and I would say that Massachusetts has some updates to do right now, and I'm hopeful that those updates will come about. Um, but those updates include many of the things that I've already mentioned. So being able to track a ballot is not something that we can currently do. Um, so adding that, uh, affirming that every voter knows that they can get absentee ballot and vote that way, um, is just a few of the items. Sure, and so, I mean, the State House sometimes can be a little slow with how, with moving bills through. Uh, by what point does this bill need to be passed for it to make a difference for 2020? Yesterday. I mean, I do think, I think it is imperative because the other thing is, as I've said, that time is, time is not on our side right now. And so the sooner that everybody has clarity on what the law is and what they need to do to adhere to that law, the better off we will all be. So it is, it is imperative that this move quickly. Now, you know, I say that and I also want to make sure that it is vetted and everybody goes through it carefully um, and that we don't create problems that we didn't intend to create. But at the same time, uh, having uh, security in our knowledge of what needs to be done and what we can do with it and knowing that we have the budget to be able to pull it off is critical. Right. And you mentioned mail-in voting. I want to delve into that a little bit more. Um, Massachusetts has a bill that's pending that would allow for widespread mail-in voting. Uh, I believe Senator Kamala Harris of California has also introduced a bill in Congress. Um, but what are some of the hurdles to getting there? There are a few states right now, I understand, that have universal mail-in voting, but that's by far not the vast majority of the country. So what are some of the hurdles to getting there? Well, one of the hurdles, I mean, so the states that have been doing it for a long time, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, they've been doing it for a really long time and they know how to do it. And, they, and every time there are, changes that they make to tweak to, to doing it. So to propose a, a new law and, and in a presidential where it's expected to be high turnout and do it well is a big lift for all of these states. Um, so one hurdle is just getting the infrastructure in and the people power and the ballot, uh, ballot counting devices in order to I mean, I would recommend that those ballots be counted early, not on election day to the extent that you can do that so that you don't have a paper jams and things like that on election day. So all of that is, um, is, a, is a tricky part. And then there's also just this sort of general mistrust at the moment about what vote by mail means. Is it a partisan coup to try to, on either side? And you know, we always say like, okay, we've got some very blue states that are using this and Utah, a red state that is using this. There's no difference in who takes advantage of, uh, of mail, vote by mail options. Uh, so that should really just be cast aside. And yet, people are using that argument as a way to try to, to prevent this. John, I want to go back to you for a second. Uh, given the environment that we're in, mail in, mail in voting will take longer to get results. Um, and we're used to a cult, we have a culture now where we're used to the AP and CNN and all the networks calling states as quickly as possible. So given that, um, and given some of the distrust around uh, mail-in voting, uh, what challenges might there be um, with respect to uh, uh, legitimacy around the election? Absolutely, and I think mail-in voting is the way that we're gonna be able to have a free and fair election, but people need to adjust their expectations. That in California, they're gonna be counting votes uh, for a week or two after the election. And California probably won't decide who the next president is but Arizona might, and, and Arizona isn't entirely vote by mail, but usually in Arizona, 70 or 80% of the vote in a normal election is cast by mail. This year, it may be higher. Uh, in Arizona, there's a lot of scenarios where that's the tipping state, the tipping point state on the presidential, and there's a key Senate race there this year as well. One of the challenges that we've seen is that in, in recent years, the late arriving vote and the votes that are counted later 
are a lot different than the votes that are counted early. Um, Senator Kirsten Sinema was elected in 2018 in Arizona. Uh, on election night, that race looked very close. By the time all the votes, all the legal votes were counted, she had a pretty substantial win, but that margin expanded every day because often uh, lower income people, people of color, are more likely to return their ballot later in the, in the year, so they're counted later. One of my worries is that you know on election night, you know, there's a small lead for a candidate in Arizona that changes three days later, and that there's going to be all sorts of misinformation and conspiracy theories that that lead out of that. And I think it's really important for folks in the media who are reporting on this to create an expectation that we're not going to know who won the presidential election on election night. Uh, there's a very strong chance that it takes a week or two. Um, that doesn't mean anyone is doing anything conspiratorial. It doesn't mean ballot boxes are being stuffed. But, you know, we know that older voters get their ballots in early and younger people and people of color tend to hold on to them a little bit longer. And that's going to change the order in which they're counted. Sure. Do you foresee this as being a potentially more litigious election cycle? Oh, absolutely. I think it's the Full Employment Act for, for election lawyers. Um, that you know, we're already seeing a lot of lawsuits. Uh, we've got folks out there fighting for to expand the right to vote in every state in the country. You know, just this week in Oklahoma, uh, you were required to have a notarized affidavit to to get a vote by mail ballot in the state, and and a notary could only do 20 of them total for the election cycle, which is a huge impediment to people voting by mail. Lawsuits got that thrown out just this week. You know, we're going to be seeing lots of litigation before the election, hopefully we can get rules everyone is comfortable with. Uh, but yeah, there, there will be all sorts of lawsuits afterward as well. Okay. Um, changing gears a little bit, Seti, I wanted to talk about local elections. Um, they usually have very low turnouts anyway. And so um, I was wondering, I wanted to get your take on how you think the pandemic and ensuing economic crisis is gonna affect, their, how they're gonna affect local elections this year. What are you well, looking out for? I think it depends a lot on what Rachel was saying, you know, how quickly we can get resources to the states, um, how quickly we can make sure people know where to vote, when to vote, um, how quickly we can make sure we have proper staffing, um, how quickly we can get uh, vote by mail in. I mean, all these things are critical as far as um, people's ability to vote and turnout. Um, you can have people that want to vote, but they don't want to endanger their lives going to a polling station if they think they're not going to be safe. Um, or if they think they're going to be standing in line for eight hours, like we saw in Wisconsin, seven hours, like we saw in Wisconsin. So I think it's really dependent upon uh, these things that are being, that need to be put in place that aren't in place now. And I, I am worried, but you, you asked Rachel, you know, when do these things need to be in place? Uh, they needed to be in place yesterday. There's so much that needs to happen between now and election day uh, to make sure there's there's real access for everyone to get to the polls safely or get their ballot in by mail. Um, you both mentioned now yesterday, especially for Massachusetts, but I'm wondering if anybody on the panel, Rachel, I'll start with you, sees a state that's working on this now and is a, could be a leader or a model for how other states might approach this cycle. Well, I would say, I mean, it's not that necessary. I think everybody's working on it uh, and, and, you know, whether they're in power or not in power. Um, but I think looking to the states that have done vote by mail for a really, really long time is the place to go to to understand the thinking process that went into the policies that they have in place so that those make sense. And that is, there's just, you know, you always want to go to the people who've been doing something for a long time for that kind of expertise to understand it and how they communicate effectively with their voters about how to do it. You know, one of the things that we always talk about in political science and in policy is that there's, there's always a learning curve to these policy changes. And people will inevitably not quite get it right the first time. Um, the people who are administering it and the people who are using the policy in whatever way. Uh, so getting the expertise of the people who have been administering the policy for a very long time is critical as well as um, as well as uh, going to as well as just sort of putting in that infrastructure that they have. 
One of the things, oh, did you wanna answer, John? Yeah, just, uh, just this week, the governor of California declared that California was gonna mail a ballot to every single registered voter. So I think they really should be looked at as a model here. A lot of the counties were already gonna do all mail ballot to everyone, but it's now going statewide and, and they've really prioritized that and it should be a model that the rest of us follow. I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, resources and making sure that we have all the supplies we need. But I mean, people, just regular people can't get hand sanitizer right now. So, you know, that seems critical for the election. How, I guess, I don't want to paint too dire of a tone, but how likely is it that we'll be able to get what we need to set the election up for success? Rachel, do you want to go? Well, I would say that goes back to the timing issue and knowing what policies need to be in place as soon as possible and then ordering that hand sanitizer now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it, it, and, and ordering all of this. I mean, there needs to be extra paper. There needs to be, there, there, we need to have our ballot machines ready to go. We need to have tape um, so that we have our six foot line and a lot of tape. <laughs> <laughs> there are potentially going to be a lot of voters that day and, and expanded early voting. Um, but just thinking through every piece of the supply chain and, and essentially you're absolutely right. I mean, we need to anticipate that there are going to be problems with the supply chain. And so the earlier that everybody can get, um, get started on, on making these orders and having everything ready to go, the better off all of us will be. I also, I wanted to ask a question about the actual act of campaigning. Seti, you've been in elected office. And so, um, you know, politics, so much of politics is meeting people, shaking hands, kissing babies. Uh, how in this environment can candidates hope to connect with voters? This is, this is going to change the landscape, particularly for local elections. Not so much federal, but state, but there are changes there too. When I ran for mayor, me and the first time, me and my campaign knocked on 10,000 doors and met people. We had house parties. Um, people still come up to me today and say, you know, I voted for you because you came to my door. Um, and I won my election by 469 votes. So, you know, when, when I thought about this question of campaigning, um, particularly for local races who can't get on television and increase their name identification, this is a real challenge. Um, I don't know that I would have been able to win that race if I couldn't have gone physically out to campaign at the local level. I don't, you know, we're not running commercials at the local level. So I do think this will alter the landscape. Um, you could see um, some challengers that really have a much more difficult time versus an incumbent at the local level because of this. Uh, so it is gonna alter the, the landscape. At the, sta at the state level, and at the local level, the last thing I'll add, uh, one of the most valuable things about going into the community is learning about the community. Um, being in, you know, we have 13 villages in Newton and they're all distinct and different. I went into those areas and met people and learned what their concerns were, which were different from another village, Newton Center versus Newtonville versus, versus uh, Nonantum, very different places within the city of Newton. So I actually became a better candidate because I was physically in these spaces and I, be, I became a better mayor because I understood the people I'd be representing. So I do think, again, particularly at the local level, that this has an effect. And I'm watching the state races. I mean, the Kennedy-Markey race uh, that's happening now, uh, they're, they are having to alter the way they campaign. I've heard from some of my friends that are working on the, those campaigns. That's a challenge, that they're not in front of people. Uh, for both of them, though, at the state level, they both have pretty good name recognition and they have money to put on commercials, but it's altering that, that kind of campaign as well. Right. Um, so what you're saying is potentially that elections aren't won and lost on Facebook with videos. It's really... Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is the question, right? I mean, we're in uncharted territory where <laughs> you're talking Facebook to, to videos for the rest of the way, probably. Um, so it will be interesting to see. But I, I again, the local races in particular are the ones that I, that I think are gonna be altered because of the lack of television ads and you know, um, having you know, higher visibility beyond their own, uh, their own circles. And I think um, the, the oh. pandemic has shown how important getting the right people into those local offices are that I think folks are realizing more than they ever have before that 
the leaders in their local communities are making a huge difference. And it's at the same time, it's harder than ever to learn about who's running in your community and then and who your options are. And I think it is also the other piece of this is that kind of contact that candidates have is so critical to people knowing that there's an election mm -hmm. and knowing what to, they need to do in order to get registered to vote and to register to vote and go out and vote. Um, so that that face to face contact is not only that you know critical learning that SETI was talking about um, that he got from actually campaigning, but voters learning all they need to know in order to be equipped to be able to take the next step to actually cast the ballot. And that's where some of the rules that we have in states like um, uh, voter registration deadlines, 20 days in Massachusetts, uh, longer in some other states, are challenging at a time like this because for, for those of us who are in elections, it's hard to un know that so many people don't know when the election will be um, when early voting will be, when the primary will be. I mean, there's just so much information that needs to be managed and managed effectively and very hard to do when you can't have that face-to-face -face contact. That, that's a really important point that you made um, just now, Rachel, because um, a key component to any local race is get out the vote, GOTV, and leading into that election days People physically put flyers on people's doors, knocking on doors to remind them there's an election. I had to, I had to go out and call multiple times, go out and put flyers on people's door multiple times because they forgot that there was a local mayor's race. They didn't know when it was. So the, the, the inability to physically do the kind of GOTV effort um, could affect turnout in, in, in some of these local races as well. That's a very good point. Yeah, and it's easy for those of us who care enough about politics to get on a live stream to talk about it, to, to forget that. But, you know, there are, uh, as Rachel was saying, there's millions of people who just don't think about this every day. They're going about their lives and have a lot of other things to worry about. And, you know, we might think that it's everywhere and it's all the time and it's in the news and it's on Facebook. But, you know, the, the example I always use is I'm not a NASCAR fan. So I don't pay attention to all the people talking about the race and I don't look at the billboards and I don't you know, see it in the newspaper. And if I was, it would be crazy to me that the whole world wasn't paying attention because there is so much information, but you have to go out and seek it out. And for people who don't care as much about politics as we do, that doesn't always happen. So I wanted to get a little bit at what can campaigns do in the absence of, in this age of social distancing, how can they reach out to voters then and, and get them to, to care, to know that there's an election? What, what, are some, what are some other ways, some tools that they have? Yeah, I think uh, we're going back to a lot of really old fashioned techniques as well as some new digital ones. You know, I think we're gonna see a lot more postcards, a lot more uh, handwritten letters, uh, old school, you know, calling your neighbor on the phone. Uh, we do a lot of polling and people have not been so enthusiastic to answer the phone and talk to a stranger in years. Uh, you know, people, we discovered what it takes to get response rates up is for people who have nothing better to do. Um, so I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation in digital tools, a lot of you know, really targeted communication online where it's not just here's a video, but hey, you care about Glenbrook Elementary School and here's my plan for it, targeted to folks in a specific neighborhood. Um, but also you know, a lot of techniques that would have worked a hundred years ago, like writing somebody a letter and, and, and uh, explaining your plan. One other thing I wanted to pick up on, Seti mentioned that in this environment, the incumbents at the local level might have an advantage. John, I wanted to ask you if you might, if you see the same thing at the, at the national level with either the presidential race or some of these um, Senate can these high profile Senate campaigns. Yeah, I think the biggest place that incumbents have an advantage right now is fundraising that, you know, just like Seti was talking about where folks rely on face-to-face -face contact with voters. It's also the best way to raise money in a lot of these races is going to an event or being able to communicate with folks. So challengers are definitely gonna have a, challenge, a harder time raising money, although a lot of them have been quite successful. I don't think that the incumbency is really gonna help on the presidential race. You know, both Joe Biden and Donald Trump have close to 100% name ID. Folks know who they are. Uh, and you know, with my partisan hat, you know, I think that we'll have the more it's a referendum on the, how the folks feel about the pandemic, you know, it, 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 
that may may not help the incumbent in the presidential case. I do think for congressional races and, and Senate races, though, uh, there's only so much attention out there. There's only so much oxygen in the room. Uh, and the more of it that goes to you know, the presidential race and to the pandemic, the less that it's available to necessarily raise the, the, the name ID and the profile of a, a congressional challenger or a Senate challenger. Thank you. Um, so last question before we get to the q and I wanna make sure we leave enough time. Um, this one's for Rachel. I just, I wanted to give people a sense of what they can do to protect themselves, protect their health and their right to vote um, this November. Well, uh, first thing is to advocate for policies that you want at the state level and to uh, support the efforts to make the necessary reforms in the states. And then on, if it's actually voting, you know, taking advantage of vote by mail where you can. I think that's first and foremost, the easiest uh, thing to do. Although I, I say easy, but I, I do qualify that um, because it is challenging for people with disabilities, for uh, young people who don't necessarily um, look at their mail. Um, I mean, there's lots of issues around mail. So, um, so then taking advantage of early voting where it's available and then on actual election day, um, or in early voting, if it's face-to-face, -face, doing all of the stuff that the CDC is recommending, face masks, gloves, um, and, and just taking that, that, that day very seriously. I, I also think, um, as communities think about it, another thing that they need to really think about are should schools be open that day? if there are schools um, that are open <laughs> um, and, um, and, and how we engage in social distancing in locations that have a lot of people. So I think that to the extent that voters can do as much as they can before election day, they're better off. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much to our panel. We're gonna take some audience questions now. Um, both through the Q&A tonight and in some of the questions that were previously submitted, many people asked, given that mail-in voting is sort of what everybody's been talking about to make sure that we have a fair election, um, but there's also at this point in time sort of been a lack of oversight and a lack of funding of the U.S. Postal Service. Given these problems in mail-in voting, is mail-in voting a viable alternative, I guess, is the question. It is viable, and, and we certainly need to make sure that the U.S. Postal Service gets what they need, that um, they have some very onerous rules that were set on for political reasons that you know can easily be removed. Um, but yeah, making the only way I think we're going to have a safe and fair election in November is with a lot of postal mail, and that requires the, the postal service to be strong and fully funded. and And folks should absolutely hold their elected officials. I live in Washington D.C., so we don't have senators or congressmen for me to call. But everybody who does should insist that they. Uh, include the U.S. Postal Service in the bailout to make sure that it stays strong. Rachel, did you have any thoughts on that? I completely agree. I, it, it, it must be in place and it is critical that people advocate on its behalf. We cannot lose things like the Postal <laughs> Service uh, because of a pandemic and, and we cannot lose it for the long term. So we need to preserve the things that have worked for a since the beginning of time um, to, to help us um, manage these moments. Okay. We've also gotten a couple questions um, about whether or not their mail-in voting is more susceptible to tamp vote tampering. David from Jamaica Plain asked uh, about whether quote unquote vote scrubbing um, or other ways ballots could be tampered with through mail-in ballots. Um, is that a possibility or is there any data or research on voter fraud uh, through mail-in ballots? There is, and John or Rachel, you can chime in. There, there is, there's been research done. There's absolutely no evidence that uh, mail-in voting um, increases the likelihood or increases uh, voter fraud. That is not, that is not true. And there are plenty of studies out there um, that, that, that you, can, you can point to. Yeah, it's, you know, a f when SETI says none, like out of the millions and millions of votes cast in America, there have been maybe 10 or 12 that voter fraud can seriously be alleged uh, through the mail. I think that you know, one of the, the challenges is, as Rachel's been talking about, our election systems require a lot of people in a lot of places. Uh, that's hard in a pandemic, but it means that helps us to keep it safe because you know, one or two bad apples 
can make the could do some damage in a single precinct, uh, but can't do anything that would impact any uh, you know, on a nationwide scale. Um, so yeah, I think that folks who want to protect the status quo where it's hard to vote often use fake allegations of voter fraud as a way of of making it harder to pass some of the reforms that we need and that we should all speak up really forcefully that you know, studies points absolutely right there is no evidence that mail-in voter fraud is a serious problem. Roy in the audience tonight um, has asked is online voting being explored? Uh, online voting is being explored and I would argue that it should not be. This is not the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, so it, it, it is, there are lots of challenges with security issues. I mean, security and legitimacy of elections was paramount to our discussions. Not, I mean, not even 2016, going back to the 2000 election. Uh, so this is not something that has been tested um, well enough in this country to be something that we should be using right now. We should use tried and true methods to do what we know how to do. I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, next question is from uh, Jim Miller, who's watching on YouTube. And he asks, Rachel, when I mail my ballot in, I don't know if it's ever been counted. But when I vote by machine, I also don't know if the vote has been counted. So how can I be more confident in the process either way? Right, well, when you, if you're voting in Massachusetts, if you're voting by machine, you, you, when you put your your ballot through the optical scanner, you are seeing that that vote, you're seeing a tick up by one and that that vote went in. And the machine will spit it back at you if it, if it was a spoiled ballot and you have another opportunity. Uh, so you will not, if you are voting by mail, you're obviously not physically seeing it. But if we have the tracking technology to be able to at least know that, you know, to be able to sort of see just as you get track your packages, that your ballot at least made it to the election office. To the extent that we trust and we should trust that the people who are running our elections are doing their darndest to, to handle everything properly, that vote, when it arrives, will be counted and will go through the ballot machine. Great. Um, we have another question from Luann, um, who, Luann Sweeney, who wants to know whether or not we'll be ready, not just for the, the election in November, but in Massachusetts, will we be ready for the September primary? Any thoughts on that, Rachel? In the the, say the very beginning again. Oh, uh, the question was about whether or not we'll be ready for the September primary. Uh, yeah. if, if that's, when, even, that's, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> uh, I think that um, the September primary is the one, you know, this first day of school across the Commonwealth, uh, technically, if, if we're going to be having public school that day. Uh, and so I, I think, I mean, I, I think we, we can be ready. I, I have faith, but the kind of planning that I'm thinking about is the kind of planning that it needs to happen now for September as a trial run for November. Um, we have a couple more questions to get through. Um, let's see, Jane asks, um, and I, I think we've sort of covered this a little bit, but can the election polling stations be opened even, even earlier? I mean, how early could we open polling stations? What's the earliest we could do that to make sure that there's more of a chance to spread voting out? Yeah, uh, there are some states that do in-person early voting as early as five weeks before election day that folks will, can start going in person in Minnesota to vote at the end of September. Um, so that very much varies by state. Uh, and as, as Rachel and Sadie have been talking about, a lot of these rules are made at the local level and the state level. Um, and, and states absolutely should be expanding the early in-person opportunities because while mail voting works for most people, it doesn't work for everyone. And, and longer in-person period will give folks who you know, have disabilities, who, who, are, who need, would prefer to vote in person, a chance to do it more safely. Yeah, and this, this goes back to this municipal question, funding question, because, you know, it costs money to do multiple days. It costs more money. So, you know, part of this next package coming out of Washington, I'm hoping that it has money for municipalities and communities uh, so that we don't see cutbacks and the, the capacity not to do what John is, is suggesting. 
we have another question about whether or not individuals can contribute to contribute funding to helping election officials get the supplies that they need. Is there a mechanism for that? Can we donate basically to have make sure our elections run smoothly? Rachel, do you want to take that? I don't know the answer to that question. So I, I was going to um, throw it to SETI. <laughs> <laughs> If I were the mayor and I needed supplies and someone was offering it, I would, I would take it. <laughs> now, I, I don't know if there's a, um, you would probably have to, my guess is here, every city and town has their own rules of the road around accepting, uh, you know, from private entities for the purposes of public, exec you know, executing public operations. So I think you'd, I think it would be probably based on a community by community town by town basis, uh, town by town basis. But everyone we, can sign up to be a poll worker. If you want to help, you know, as, as much as the hand sanitizer would be useful, uh, and I'm sure Rachel will talk more about this, signing up and volunteering to work the polls if you're healthy and feel and can follow all the, the uh, rules is a great way to help. Great, we've got, I think, time for one more audience question, and um, we're going to take a question from Gregor, um, who is wondering, for, is this is for each of the panelists, um, whether or not you think that so much has changed as a result of the pandemic, that there will be things that fundamentally shift about the way we run elections in the future. So, John, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope that this uh, makes it a lot it gives people an impetus to expand vote by mail. We know that that helps democracy, that when, vote, when universal vote by mail is implemented, turnout goes up across the board. That's not me as a partisan talking about that. It goes up for Democrats, it goes up for Republicans, it goes up for independents, it goes up for young people and old people, that, that it expands the number of people who vote. And that's something that no matter what your opinion on the outcome of the election is, everybody should support. So I hope that this is the spur that we need to really radically rethink the way that we do elections, that places like Oregon and Colorado and Washington have been doing this safely for, for years now, uh, and their elections are free and they're fair. Both parties have won, uh, and, and we can uh, use that as a model. So, and I think as, as romantic as it is to, you know, get your cup of coffee and go down to the polling place on a cold Tuesday in November, it's not the best way to run elections and, and we can do better. Teddy, do you want to take a turn? Yeah, I, John, I think um, this could go either way. Um, you know, if, if the federal government actually uh, puts the right resources in place for communities um, and states can work with localities to make sure it's safe, they do voting by mail, then yes, I think John's right. That's the glass half full. If we don't, uh, if the federal government does not provide the kind of uh, resources that are needed, for municipalities and towns. Um, if different states are doing different types of things, some states are doing vote by mail, some states are preventing it, uh, we could do a lot of damage to our, to our system, a lot of damage. So I'm hopeful that, the, that uh, the first option is the one that happens. Yeah, I'll go with the glass half full for a moment, but I am very concerned about the, uh, the glass half empty side of it too. So for the full side, I think, I do think this is, you know, these are opportunities for major transformations in policy and those are going to stick. So if we go to vote by mail, I think it's unlikely that we're just gonna roll it back when the pandemic is over. Uh, and I think if we expand, if we make a, a same day registration, the law of some states, um, I think it is unlikely that that will be rolled back, although, you know, I say that and voting rights are often rolled back. So, um, so it depends on who's in power. Um, at the same time, the, 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 the issues around all of the kinds of policy changes that will go into effect and the kind of challenges that just a first time implementation of new policy poses for everyone will be so hard for everyone to learn and do and make that I think that that, if their funding resources are not there, there it will be challenging. Okay, I wanna thank the panelists. Thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, but before we end, I just wanna take a moment to highlight one of our other partners, the Harvard Bookstore. It's a locally owned and independent bookshop in the heart of Cambridge. 
Our speakers tonight have suggested books that support the discussion. On screen, you'll see some of the titles they've suggested, and in the chat, you can click on the links to learn more or even purchase a few of the books. After the event, we will also send you an email with the book titles just so you have the information. Thank you for attending another one of our WGBH News Forum news forums, and thank you to all of our partners, the Harvard Bookstore, Ford Hall Forum, and Mass Vote. After you exit the webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a news quiz on the election process. But before we go, please mark your calendars for our next event. We hope you'll join us again on Monday, August 17th for more insights into this year's election cycle. In the meantime, please visit wgbh.org backslash events for more upcoming virtual events in the weeks ahead. Thank you again for being with us and have a good evening.